Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. I'm just going to let people come into the Zoom room here before we get started. Okay. Oh, let's see here. All right. Um, BJ, if you want to get started, it's probably a good number here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to be together again. Happy New Year. Oh, not only Happy New Year, but today is a very extra special day. Not only is it Insurrection Day, but before it was Insurrection Day, it was Sonia Dolan's birthday. So happy birthday, Sonia. Thank it you is, very much, BJ. I'm honored to share it with the Insurrection. You would be lost if you were not born. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. Well, happy 21st. It's great. Um, okay. So, <laughs> okay. So, on to the big stuff. So, oh, you guys will recognize Tom. Tom's Tom's a meddler. Tom's been many things. We love Tom. Um, I can't remember the last time we did one of these together, Tom. Uh, I, yeah, I think maybe October or something like that, multiple loss. Yes, that fun stuff. Wow. Um, okay, well, so so Tom's gonna lead us today into a conversation, much like that conversation, which is sort of philosophical, sort of practical, and all the things that we kind of love. We should get your mind going, um, but also that soul, spirit, heart thing inside of you too, hopefully. Um, so, you know, why don't we kick it over to you here in a second time? I will follow your lead so happily and we'll do this together. But before we do that, we should do that thingy we do when Sonia does that thingy. <laughs> descriptive. Okay. So morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I um, just kind of want to let you know how to interact um, with Tom and DJ after they've gone through the slides. So you have two options. You can raise your hand and we will call on you, unmute you, and you can chat with them. Or if you prefer not to do that, you can type your question into the Q&A box and I will read it out loud for you. So again, raise your hand, speak with BJ and Tom directly, or if you just prefer not to do that, you can type it into the Q&A. Um, and uh, one of the themes that we always talk about here is you know, having it be a safe space. So if you don't want your name to be used or anything else like that, please just let us know that is important to us and want this to feel um, good and supportive and helpful. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Sons. Yeah, and I should, yeah, to, just to build on that for a sec, for folks who are new, we're going to go through slides, we'll level set, and then hopefully there'll be time to open it up for questions, comments, and it really is meant to be safe. So within the bounds of kindness, um, ask, say anything, really. Uh, this is really meant to be a place where it's hard to ask questions elsewhere. This is, it should be easy here. That's what, that's what it's meant to be. So don't be shy, but also don't feel obligated. You don't got to do nothing if you don't want to. Just listen is fine, too. So with that, Brother Tom, over to you. Thank you, BJ. Thank you, Sonia, and happy birthday. Um, today's topic is hope. And um, these topics spring sort of from my brain about things I'm thinking about and want to explore in greater depth, sort of drill down and look at the layers of what that word hope means. And when I do this, I'm often basing my thinking and my processing on all of the people that I have cared for uh, in my 40 years of being a nurse practitioner and a marriage family therapist. So many folk who are struggling with chronic and terminal illnesses. That's been my areas of expertise. So um, with that in mind, what I want to do today with is have a conversation with you all and with BJ around what hope is and what it means to us. And to do that, I'd like to bring in some of the theories of hope from the uh, psychology and philosophy, um, existential uh, thinkers. I also want to talk about hope in relationship uh, to Christianity 
and hope in relationship to activism and protest, because those seem to be where I encountered a lot of thinking around what hope is in these categories. So we're going to hit on all of them, and you may find a lot of different thoughts around what hope is and what hope can be. And so um, for today's talk, <clears throat> why don't we go to the next slide, uh, BJ, please? Mm -hmm. I chose to define hope, and there are about as there are a million definitions of hope through any different different dictionaries or uh, authors who are speaking. But for today's presentation, I'd like to focus on it being the desire for something good in the future. Very simple, very clean, <clears throat> leaves a lot of space. But in that definition, I think there's a few things that are very important to get out of the way right away. Um, the first is, you know, what really is hope? Is it a feeling inside yourself? Is it an emotion, a sensation, a state of being? Uh, are people intrinsically, extrinsically hopeful? You know, there's just a lot to it. Mm -hmm. So the things that I want to point out around what hope is which surprised me as I started looking into it, is that to be hopeful, you need to have an uncertain outcome, which seems simple, but it really expands a lot. It means that a hopeful person is in an uncertain outcome, an uncertain place. And <clears throat> generally, my opinion has reached that to be hopeful you need to have an outcome that is at least possible. And we're gonna get into that in some detail. An important aspect of hope is that it is a future focused emotion, which is kind of important to think about. You are hoping that things might be different in the future. Um, but my opinion of hope is that it not only needs to be something that you look toward to the future, but when you are hopeful, it should improve your present somehow, enrich you, calm you, uh, encourage you, expand you. I want your hope to make you more or make you calm or happy. <clears throat> What a beautiful hope, Tom. Uh, that is my hope. <laughs> and the other thing that sort of snuck up on me when I started trying to define hope is that hope is an uncertainty. Hope is also an acknowledgement that it is not wholly up to you to assure your future. So there's something bigger. When you are hopeful, you are hoping that there's something out there, whether it's God and a miracle, or whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's your psychologist to help you cope, there's something other that is part of what hope is. And I don't want people to assume <clears throat> or to feel discouraged if they don't feel hopeful. That's okay. Um, Karen Setia said, you don't always have to know what to hope for. You can hope to learn what might be coming. <clears throat> but it's sort of, as you're pointing out, Tom, it also has to have has to some this possibility of, possi of, of being possible. And we'll talk more. I know there's more to, to come on that. But that seems so key between hope being a powerfully good force or a, actually, actually something of a hurtful force. Uh, that's right on BJ, because uh, I think we can go to the uh, next couple slide or go to one. Mm -hmm. So hope, as we said, is to embrace uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the first thing I think to get around is to understand is when you are hopeful, <clears throat> you are not always in a certain place. And mm -hmm. so that's something to keep in mind. Now let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. What hope is not? And this is what BJ was referring to hope is not denial and there are places where denial has certainly served me in my life 
And there are times when I need to step away and not always look at the full truth of what's before me. So I'm not saying that denial is always a bad thing, but exactly what BJ was getting to is if your hope is unrealistic, if you are overly optimistic, or if you are absolutely sure what your outcome will be, <clears throat> those things are not hope. And the most important aspect I think of this discussion is that when you are in denial, you deactivate agency. And we're gonna talk about what that means. But my, my stance is that hope gives you agency. And agency is a term that's used often in the literature that basically just means the ability to act. If you are hopeful, you have the capacity then to move toward your hope by doing things yourself or by feeling things yourself. So your personal agency to bring about something in the future is, is what we're talking about. And that's, I think, key to what hope is, is it activates agency. And if you were in denial, I'm just going to wait for crystals to heal me, or I know that this chemotherapy will solve my problems. It's very difficult then to act. It's very difficult for you to have the internal agency to move forward. Does, does that make sense to you all? And wow. It certainly does. And there's, so, there's a lot of sinews in here to tease apart. Like your word here, expectation is so important. It's, Hope can bleed into a sense of expectation. Dashed hopes really tend to be dashed expectations. And that, that relationship to the outcome is so intricate and important. You may want something, may wish for something, but that doesn't mean it's going to come. It doesn't mean we can't be hopeful. But I, I just find myself in my own life and with people I work with, there can be such a thin veil between this hope thing and this expectation thing. Um, and I yeah. think that something that occurred to me is that hopefulness is not mm -hmm. always the most comfortable place to exist. Mm -hmm. In hopefulness, you're in uncertainty. You're wishing for something. Mm -hmm. But if you're in denial or if you're in surety, you're in a more comfortable space. Mm -hmm. And so there is an aspect of hope that carries with it some restlessness yeah very much so and it is i mean as you're mapping it out with you know the this idea of uncertainty of course we think of it in our work around folks who are in ourselves who are dealing with big health issues or you know uncertainty with a capital u but there's also sort of a day-to-day -day version here too we don't know what's coming tomorrow i mean we we're pretty sure the sun's going to come up. We're pretty sure that you know this and that's going to happen. Um, but again, this is not. This is a daily exercise, whether we even acknowledge we're doing it or not. Um, and it is some. It seems to be this this I don't know, coefficient between the present and the future. This variable that colors our way forward, one way or another. As always, you are speaking to the next slide, BJ. Hands up, you right back. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But um, I'm temp uh, Okay, so go to the next slide. Sorry. No problem. So what BJ is speaking about is time and the issues of when you have a a feeling or an emotion like hope that's future focused, then time becomes very important. And you forget how important time is unless you lose it. Um, and uh, so I think it's something to, to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at the, the, you need to look to the future, but the value of hope is that it needs to enrich the present. And uh, so it needs to enrich the presence and it also needs to give uh, meaning to your life. When you become hopeful, you can have some meanings which then generate 
movement and action and agency. And anyone who saw the multiple loss talk or who knows BJ and I know that we both sort of focus on existential beliefs in, in, in um, philosophies. And so there's some overlap that we're going to get into in talking about this. Now, uh, as we were talking about, there's a great book called Life is Hard by Kiran Setia. And in it, he says, to hope well is to be realistic about probabilities, not to succumb to wishful thinking or be cowed by fear. This is how we should approach life's hardships, finding possibility where we can, the possibility of flourishing with disability or disease or fund finding one's way through loneliness, failure, or grief. This is the value of hope. I think. And that's quite a value, isn't it? I mean, it's huge. Uh, you know, I think, you know, hopelessness, put another way, the absence of hope is one of the markers of depression, you know? Yes. So uh, this is, yeah. Well, shall we move on to the next one? So the, I want to say one other thing around. Oh, sure. Time. And, mm -hmm. and that is a, a world that has no future means that every parting with a friend is a death. And in a world without future, every loneliness is final. And, and, you know, if you can't, that's why I think BJ's comment around placing yourself in a timeline, your past and your future need to enrich your, your present. And so hope is something that can kind of bridge those realities between your future and your present to make your life more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous, man. All right, moving, moving ahead. Hoping while alive. I believe that Leonard Cohen said, uh, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And I, what, I'm, what I'm going for here is that our woundedness sometimes can be our healing it can expand us and open us to the light that we weren't seeing when we were whole. And that what Emily Dickinson is saying here is that there's something perching on your soul that is always a spark, that is always positive, uh, and that's hope, and that it never stops. And um, Verena Cast, who's a Swiss psychoanalyst, someone that I also have a great deal of respect for, made the point that suicide in itself is a hopeful gesture in that someone is recognizing that the future of non-existence is better than what we have now. And so I believe that if you are alive, you have hope. Um, and I recognize that sometimes people can't see that or can't feel that. But I want to say that I believe that there is a spark inside and that that spark has value in improving your present by expanding your future outlook. Does any of that make sense? Sure does. And if you're talking, you're making me think too. These distinctions seem so important. Trying to be, you know, accurate with our words, and because so much can hang in the balance. And like you're saying, there's this, there's an implied or needs to be to be hope to qualify as hope is that there's this possibility of goodness. There, it, it, um, but that that implies that there's a possibility of badness too, and that seems to be an important distinction between hope and say sort of positive, positive attitudeness, where you just kind of impose a positivity on just about anything. I think you know, that's a great that point. Has its, yeah, I, yeah. That has its power for some people, but it, it can run into a lot of trouble quickly. It's an excellent point, BJ, because when I do the literature of looking into the, all of the history of hope, you get a lot of kind of happy sayings, you know, mm -hmm. keep your chin up and look to the future. Mm -hmm. That's not what hope is. Hope is 
embracing in uncertainty. And, mm -hmm. and um, when you have those sort of trite statements around hope, you deactivate agency. That isn't, that isn't the sort of plumbing into the depths of your soul about what you're feeling. It isn't moving you forward. It might be comforting and uh, denial can be comforting for a period of time, but it doesn't stir you up or process where you're going. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can move on. Okay. How are people doing? Is this working okay for y'all? Just let me know if there's any. Uh, I think it is. Sonia, you keeping an eye on the chat and things in case. Yeah. Yeah. Comes up. Yeah. Okay. All, all good. Thanks. All right. So one of the places where hope comes up a lot is in myths. And I'm talking about Western Judeo-Christian myths. I'm not very smart about any of the others. But first of all, this is a painting by George Watts. And it's depicting hope. She's actually sitting on the world and she's blindfolded and she has one string left in her lyre, but she's plucking away at that thing. So I thought that was powerful. I want to talk about three myths and just make some brief judgments or opinions about what these are saying to us. The first myth is Sisyphus. You guys remember Sisyphus? He was doomed forever to roll a rock uphill. And the minute he got to the top of the hill, he didn't quite get there and the rock rolled down and he had to go back and haul the rock up again. And um, looking into that myth in a little more detail, there's a couple issues. The first is that uh, Sisyphus basically uh, was mortal, first of all, and he tricked the gods he tricked death. Death came for him and he handcuffed death and ran away. And so no one could die while Sisyphus was a free man. So the gods finally got tired of that and they went back and captured Sisyphus and freed death and then everyone could keep dying. But they made Sisyphus immortal. And in their in making him immortal, they gave him eternal punishment of having to roll the rock up the hill and never achieve your goals. So I think that's interesting to me. First is that he had to be immortal to have this hopeless task. And the second is that the gods at least viewed that there would be no meaning in this life if he didn't achieve his goal. So, I'm not so sure about either of the, about those things. And we'll come back to that in a minute, but the other guy I want to talk about in myths is Prometheus. And I think he was a demigod or a half god or something and uh Prometheus disobeyed the gods and gave mankind fire. And the way they punished him was chaining him to a rock and having an eagle come and eat his liver every freaking day. And then overnight, the interesting kind of bizarro thing is the liver would heal, the eagle would go away, and he'd lay there overnight, and then it would all happen again. And it's almost like the punishment, besides the painful torture of ripping out your liver, the punishment is to not die and to have it happen in the same way endlessly. So with these two myths, I find myself thinking about hopefulness and realizing that it may be that a person has to be mortal and face their death to feel hopeful. Um, and maybe that's that whole aspect of embra embracing uncertainty. The other thing that I wonder about, particularly in regards to Sisyphus is maybe goals are not everything that brings meaning or happiness to our life. Maybe while he's rolling the rock up the hill, he can see the sunrise and it's sweet. So I think that there's just a few things around myths in that. And before we leave myths, the last thing I want to talk about, of course, is Pandora and her box or her amphora. 
And the gods, get, apparently Pandora was the first woman, they created her specifically to hand out this amphora full of stuff to mankind. It's a little iffy, but whatever. Um, so they know that Pandora is going to actually open the box, <clears throat> even though they told her not to. She opens the box and out flies all the evils of the world, pestilence, death, suffering, war. She realizes she's made a mistake and she clamps back on the lid and traps one evil inside. And the evil is hope. And so you got to ask like, well, what were the Greeks? I believe that's a Greek myth. What are they trying to say? What are they saying that hope is evil? And, um, you know, Nietzsche said in talking about this, that hope was the last evil in the box. And it's the worst because it protects the torment of man. So I think that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what to make of that. Did the Greeks have a different view of hopefulness than I do? You know, I think hope is is a is a really cool thing at promoting agency, but maybe they don't have that opinion. That's myths. Any thoughts on that, BJ? Well, I wonder too, because like like our, your earlier slides, Tom, where we're teasing apart some of these really important distinctions. I think one way, one thing's clear is that hope is a very powerful tool, and like powerful tools, it can be used for good or ill. It can delay important truths and delay your relationship with reality and prolong suffering in that way, mm -hmm. or do this other thing that you're talking about. And maybe it's maybe there's maybe these are different words, you know. But I like I kind of like the double edged of hope. It is a powerful thing, and so. Let's give it that due. And we need to, it's on us to wield it carefully. You know, I'm reminded of one of the things that comes up in healthcare. You know, a lot of the, the polling of oncologists specifically. Why, you know, do you tell your patients the full truth as you see it of your of their situation? And many oncologists will will admit to saying, uh, no, I don't. And the reason why is because I don't want to take away hope. Yeah. which is a very frustrating response because first of all, it's not theirs to give or take. Uh, and second of all, then they're sort of shunting towards this sort of Nietzschean hope um, yes. and causing accidentally well-intended, but causing more trouble. And I think we see that play out and not to knock on oncologists. This is, that's just where the data are. Um, but we see this in healthcare all the time. And I think you and I and others in metal and elsewhere in palliative care spend a fair amount of time <laughs> untwisting that knot. Yeah, everyone wants to live in certainty. And the only place that certainty lives is in denial. And mm -hmm. so if you're in hope, you're in an uncertain place. And that's a little uncomfortable, but it's also incredibly enriching. Um, so that, I think that's exactly right on. Let's quickly go through some theorists. Yeah. And, but I won't I won't bore people with too much of this. No, but it's I so good. Some of these folk have some really interesting and differing thoughts around what hope is. Ernst Bloch was a East German after World War II, and he wrote three huge books on theories of hope, which I, I of course, it's beyond me to read that stuff. But what I came away with from his summaries is one thing is super powerful to me is he believes our daydreams are our hopes. And so I would say, think about the last time you daydreamed. Maybe you imagined yourself Superman flying over the buildings or defeating the cancer or you know, bringing love to the world. What are your daydreams? and recognize that those are also your hopes. He also points out that to hope, you need to be knowingly dissatisfied, which I find pretty rich. Now, Snyder, who's earlier uh, in this, in the 20th century, he wrote about hope as a goal pursuit. And I'm grateful for that because I'm kind of a brass tacks kind of guy. Here's what I know. Here's where I want to go. And so I appreciate him speaking of hope 
as something that gives you the ability to pursue a goal. So that's where we get that. And by the way, all these people will be listed at the end of this talk. I have a, a reference list so you can pursue this if you wish. Two more people I want to talk about. One is Lear. And he had the concept of radical hope. Radical hope is um, a benevolence that extends beyond the self. Hope in goodness, in humanity, hope that things will turn out all right. That's that kind of more general sense of well-being. And this is the hope, radical hope, that also has relevance in Christian thinking. And we're going to talk about Christianity in, in more detail in the next slide, so I'll leave that be. But just consider the difference in that hope versus Snyder's hope or Bloch's hope. And the lastly, um, Hearth spoke in nursing theory about hope in the terminally ill. And her comments were that hope does not have to be future focused, but instead it could be an inner power that's directed toward enrichment of being. So that it's less about doing or moving forward, which is what Snyder would say, and more about just being, less doing and more being. Those are the theorists. We can move on to Christianity if you're ready. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's also a response to it also helps us get back to the slide before about myth, which is these are the, this is open to interpretation. There are there are theories. Oh. This is not a concrete thing issue. Well, and, and all um, these guys reached different opinions about the subtleties, like you said, teasing yeah. it out. They all have sort of different opinions about what hope it could or be could be. Yeah. And none more accurate than the other that's right that's sort kind of the joy of our, this being a human thing this just objective mm, squishiness annoying and wonderful um okay so let me move on to to christianity hope in christianity really surprised me because while i was raised christian i didn't always fully view myself as a christian but reading the literature, I was very moved by some aspects of what they're saying. And in particular, I wanted to tease this out because this type of hope that's defined in the Christian thinking is kind of different than the hope that BJ and I have been talking about up till now. And by that, I mean, Christian hope talks more about abiding. Christian hope is about waiting in trust stepping back and patiently waiting and allow God to work his or her miracle through me. So these uh, hope in Christianity is associated with uh, the grace of God rather than work or self-improvement or projection to the future. Um, I'm Think of the quote, which I did know as a kid, faith, hope, and love. We all know that from the Bible. Hope allows us to wait in faith for God. Without hope, we lose faith. Without faith, we can't know the love of God. So I find that very powerful and Parts of it are very appealing. They're comforting, aren't they? They're comforting. To have this type of hope, you, you're, you're waiting in patience, in patience. You're, you're sort of in, at more peace. And so the hope I've been talking about has to do with possibly agitation, movement forward, living in uncertainty. This hope is a little different. There's a, a hope, however, so I started looking for how would a Christian apply this hope to the world today? And I found what I think is an amazing quote from a divinity student at Harvard who only graduated in 2021. And he said, when we hope, we invite God to move and breathe through us. As long as darkness still reigns and as long as wickedness still runs rampant, we, by hoping, do not deny the evil we combat but we affirm that God is not done working, and therefore neither are we. That's Aiden Luke Stardard. And so that, that felt to me like, ah, that, that brings me back to our, 
action and movement and and hope as an invigorator. Mm. What do you think of those? I, I love that. Like you, I was raised in an Episcopalian tradition or a Christian tradition, and uh, and I would consider myself agnostic now. But love, hope, faith, forgiveness these have lingered in me in some way. And as you're speaking, I realize that I'm somewhere baked in what you're describing. And I like, and I've seen with folks who say, state identify as Christian. I've seen couples. A couple, a couple couples leap to mind where one they both said the same words, but as each of them came towards the end, one had a an, their hope, their faith bled into expectation, and then profound disappointment when they didn't get that miracle that they were hoping for, or, or as they could recognize. And one had more the version of hope, this more nuanced thing that you are describing. And it, it was powerful to watch this distinction because the other person that well, the person who had the hope you're describing sailed into their death. Um, it wasn't they were not that they were weren't free from fear, but part of the difference is that the, the if you you have to submit yourself. That's why I love the idea of Yahweh. Like you can't even. It's gotta, you can't even name this God. You, you can't pretend to, un, to understand God's machinations. But, and if you do, you're probably going to get it wrong. So this idea of hope and faith requires that you kind of have to submit yourself to what will be. Um, and that seems like an important ingredient or that you may not even be able to recognize the miracle, the miracle that might happen or it might be of a different flavor. So, and one way or another, it's coming back to this, as I'm listening to you talk and I'm thinking about our experiences with people at the bedside, where is this help and where is this hurt? Yeah. And I'm back to this notion of you know, submitting yourself to what will be is very importantly different from trying to ram yourself into a certainty or a future that you really expect. Uh, I've been a good boy. Why I need, you know, where's my return on investment? I'm saying yeah. a bunch of different things here, but there's, there's, again, I'm really loving how we're teasing out. And I think that in the division here is this exquisite div division where this, this, this force is, is a force for good or a force for pain. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with all of that. I, I think it's really how, how can help help you? How can it make your life better today? How can it empower you to move toward your future? And uh, I see that in the hope of abiding in God's love, but I see it also in other hopes. So let's go to the next slide, BJ. Hope as activism. This is the other place that we saw lots of thoughts around what hope can be. And in this hope, Rebecca Solonent wrote a beautiful book called Hope in the Dark about how hope basically can give you a kick in the ass, shove you out the door and move you toward doing something to change the world. You know, hope is not a guarantee that you will be healed of your cancer or that the world won't end or that uh, Trump won't be elected president again or whatever you might want to rally against. But hope might give you the enthusiasm and the agency to go out and make a change. And in making a change or moving toward a change, you create meaning in your life. And so when you have something to hope for and you are actively striving to make that happen, energy comes to you and it becomes like a self-feeding uh, mechanism. Okay, I know we're getting a little short on time and I want to give space for questions. So let unless you got something else, BJ. Yeah, let's go to existential thinking. Um, this is something that we've talked about all through the talk. And it, it has an existentialist believe that the world is random and that it is up to you to create the meaning in your life. What I ran into time and time again is that until you have a meaning to your life, you really can't create a hope. So if you have something that you believe in, then you can hope for something in the future. 
And so these two things work very closely together to choose your meaning. As long as there is meaning, there is hope. The process of dying is an opportunity to discover new meaning, not necessarily a dark death sentence. So I want us to keep that in mind. Um, the last thing I want to say about existentialism is that Camus, Albert Camus, an existentialist, wrote a whole book about Sisyphus, the guy back in myths. And in it, he basically said his world is random, he is hopeless, and that's the only way that he can be happy. And I believe that that's where I take exception. I think maybe Sisyphus can be happy if he looks at his world around him and engages maybe less in goal pursuit and more in the uncertainty of the future or uncertainty of the present. BJ? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's, I think that's right on. I'm, it, as you're talking, it's almost like a, this kind of hope, it's not quite an attitude, it's, but it's a coloring. It brings yeah. like, it's a, a color to the glass as light moves through you, as you move through the world, it colors your experience and it colors what you do. And it's almost like a filter you can put on something. Um, and I'm, I'm with you. I, 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 I have come back around to hope. I used to think I needed to be as an existentialist. I needed to be a little bit more harsh in the sense and that kind of Camus notion of hopelessness. I think it's very daring to have hope in this way we're talking as long as we hold outcome a little lightly to your point about Sisyphus. Was it really a punishment? If Sisyphus loved process versus outcome, yeah, <laughs> then maybe Sisyphus is a pretty happy guy, you know, and maybe there's some wisdom between this sort of buzz, for, excuse the buzz phrasey stuff, but there is something really powerful to loving the process versus mm -hmm. whatever the outcome is going to be. And I think you're pointing us to it. And there's something uh, sort of very strong, not sort of daring about hope, which I yes, love I, that reframe. I agree with that. And uh, let's go to one more slide and yep. then we'll reach toward the end. Uh, yeah. hope and the elevating emotions. I just want to make the point that many times when we're in dark and despairing places, we think we need to process our depression and our sadness. And of course we do. That's very real. But Verena Cast in her book, Joy, Inspiration and Hope, she makes the point that you can find just as much meaning in your life by processing your joy, by rediscovering your hope, and by, by living in the elevating emotions. And I'm not saying that as a way of moving away from your depression or your sadness or your miseries, but balance it. Live in a world that has both the positive and the painful emotions because you are fully a human being when you're expressing everything. Okay, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I'm not going to touch that one. It's so beautiful, Tom. Let that be. Yeah. I love this picture. It's Winslow Homer, the Gulf Stream. And here is hoping in a dark world. Those of us who are sick, who are dying, depressed, alone, we can all hope. Hope can give us the tools to cope, to move forward, to assert control to stay engaged in the world. By hoping you can improve our present circumstances just by looking to the future. It gives us the ability to act, to make things better. And this picture, as you guys can see, he's really up against it with sharks all around him. And off to the right, he has a, a, a wind funnel that could wipe him out. But if you see up off to the left, in the distance, there's a ship that might be his rescue. And that's where I'm saying, hold your uncertainty, embrace it, and act to move toward your future in hopefulness. So good, so awesome. Um, well, beautiful, Tom. Shall we, in the interest of time, shall we go to questions, comments now? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I hope that worked okay. for you. Yeah. And Tom, sure worked for me, Tom. Quick question for you, for actually for both of you. Is it okay if we go a little bit over? I just, I know we yes. have some questions and I feel like the, the responses will be good as well. Okay, great. So yeah. um, BJ, if you want to go to the next slide, sir, so that we can have the references up for a quick second, and then I'll ask um, one of the questions that came in. Um, so this person asked, how do you handle it when a lot of people who surround you have overwhelming positivity that I actually find soul suffocating and numbing, but they find your hope negative or that you have given up? That's an interesting question. Um, well, the hope that this person seems to be referring to is kind of that vacant hope or uh, uh, their denial around the reality of the situation. Um, how do you deal with that? I think that partially the richness of your hope, the fullness of what you're feeling inside yourself should be enough to bolster yourself against whatever negative winds might be in front of you. Well, what we're trying to do is to give you a way to hope that will sustain you through un unrelenting hopefulness and positivity, as well as the pain and the suffering that's very real in the world. Yeah, I have. I agree with that. There's not an easy way here. And I'm sure that I, I, I have my own versions of bumping up against that, that version of hope. Like we were saying earlier, maybe we need another word to distinguish what these, this, these, these varietals. Um, but I really love what you just said, Tom, of you should hold such a big and powerful version of hope yourself that it can help mollify whatever's coming at you, whether it's the toxicity of chemotherapy or the toxicity, toxicity of positive attitude. Um, and I, maybe, I, just maybe, oh, sorry, Tom. I was just going to say, maybe if, depending on the communication, maybe there's a beautiful conversation to be had to say, hey, you know, my version of hope includes holding the hard stuff too, you know, is not denying the hard stuff. It's really important for me to look at that. You can join me, family or not, but I'm going to do that. And so you you do you, I'll do me. So maybe there's a conversation in there to be had to kind of clarify these things. Um, and he, even to the point, I think of like, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but I love this moment. And I hope that this will be my future. But right now I'm here with you and let's let's be real. You know, it's like your opportunity or your meaning in your life might be to inform someone about your hope. You might be able to shift their world a little further, a little closer to something real. So maybe if you go back to what's bringing meaning to your life, it will be enough to sustain your hope and expand it in, in that conversation. Amen. I think it also gets at why other things we talk about grief, other things that have the possibility of, you know, building a bigger capacity for bigger, fuller emotional truths. You know, in a sense, is I feel for your family in a way. I, I bump into this in my family too, and that that kind of positivity belies a kind of a brittleness. Yes, that they can't tolerate this notion of things going wrong. Um, and forgive the language, it's all sort of shorthand, but maybe a way in for you is, is just to tolerate, to begin the conversation is to see that side of their, of that positivity too, that must be so hard to live in this world, to have to constantly be shutting out anything hard or negative. Those poor people, that must be so dang difficult. And I'm not, you, you know your emotional state, you know your family, but that may be a way into the conversation so it's just less exhausting and less that's beautiful i totally agree with that Sones, what else we got yeah, yeah. this one is a, a two-parter so the first part of the question is how to counter the quote-unquote false hope mindset to move to a realistic hope and are there those who are reluctant to perhaps need to cling to that false hope narrative Wow, that's uh, kind of a similar question to the first one. Um, so I, uh, 
I don't have the exact right answer to that, but I thought that BJ's last comment around, yes, the false narrative and people clinging to it may be what they need. And what I've said in our talk before, it's like sometimes even I need some denial. I need to move away. I need to live in a safe space. And so I guess each of us are going to be in a different place at a different time. Um, and it's up to you to, uh, if you're looking for a way to counter it, you may not want to tear down their denial because they may really need that now. And so you may want to find authentic ways of conversing with this person and being with them. And that could be simply telling your truth. You know, you're, I'm living in uncertainty and I'm okay with that and, and just proceeding from there. Sones, can you read the second half of that question? I want to make sure I didn't miss it. Once. Yeah, Actually, yeah, of course. It's, it's um, are, those, are there those who are reluctant to perhaps need to cling to a false hope narrative? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ditto, Tom. Uh, seeing these things, I can feel obnoxious, but seeing, again, w the, the usefulness, utility of narrowing the aperture when you're overwhelmed to control some of the inflex. And really, our, we're, we're probably smarter than we think we are or give ourselves credit for it. We temper our inflows to some degree as a temporizing, as a temporary measure. Um, it can cause trouble if you get stuck there. But uh, anyway, I just to, I, I'll just repeat what Tom just said. I think that I think that's the if the, there's not an answer. I think that's a good response. There's right. not an answer. Uh, I, but I also feel that um, if you can live in the uncertainty of hope. It's such an authentic place to live uh, that it can often break down some of the denial that you might encounter. Um, but people got their own issues, so I, I would let them have their space, but respond to them in, in your authentic world. Amen. That, that, that authentic thing, I think we're going to keep coming around to that in this world we're living in now, where a lot of assumptions are kind of ripping it down, all, all sorts of stuff. That, there's something really, I think we're being reintroduced about the potency of just what what is the truth like just be real whatever the heck that is really sad really happy whatever it is um that seems to be the way through and there's also a pride that comes with that like if you're living in the truth as best as you can best as you can find that that has its own power its own end and i think to back to your point tom if you are finding yourself living in authenticity you that will serve you, but it's also beautifully contagious. Uh, and right. I bet you'll find people coming to you. And they may not even know why, but they will. There, there's a there's a magnetism, I think, like I said, increasingly so these days. Got quite a few other questions coming in here, so I'll just keep keep going through them. Um, this person said, "Could you comment on how hope might evolve over the course of illness, from devastating diagnosis through challenging treatments towards inevitable death?" Yeah, um, I think that that uh, that's a great question because what we hope for, if we were looking at the tasks that Snyder is talking about is obviously going to change if you base your hopes on what's real. And so you can hope that your chemotherapy will be very responsive and you'll have complete remission. And if that doesn't happen, you might hope for more time. And so what you hope for will certainly change. The point I think I was making in talking about existentialists is that if we have a meaning to what we're doing, to how we're acting, to our life, that will generate what we hope for. And so you may reach a place where you may hope to leave a legacy to your children. You may hope to painlessly transition to hospice. So what we hope for as the task may shift, but the most important thing is what's giving your life at this moment meaning and how your uh, how it's en enriching you living in the uncertainty of what comes next. 
I'm so glad you brought this up that hadn't really come up before of like what the dynamism of hope and it can shift over time. In fact, it generally kind of needs to perhaps, but anyway, yeah, that's a huge, huge point. And cl clinically, you know, that's a, when hope comes up, it's really so important to contextualize it. Hope for what? Frame it. Um, and that can move, that can change. We encourage it to. Um, so, and so I'm sorry, I keep doing this to you. Do you mind reading the question one more time? My brain's all over the place. I just want to make sure we're not missing something. Yeah, no problem. So it was, could you comment on how hope might evolve over the course of illness from mm -hmm. diagnosis yeah. through treatment through uh, up to death? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, I think we're there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, BJ, I think you'll love this one. It's Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. Does beauty foster hope? Oh, man. I, so beauty, I don't know, as I keep moving through the world, uh, beauty is where I'm landing again and again. Uh, and beauty, I like Hegel's uh, notion of it. It's sort of the truth incarnate. The truth, the form of truth, not pretty, not beauty as in pretty, like, you know, whatever we do with our uh, sort of modern notions of what, what constitutes beauty. I mean it in this big sense, this, this truthful thing, the truth in form. So for me, beauty is where it's at because it also bridges to the material world, the body. It's not just a notion or an idea or an attitude. It bridges us to the material world in such a way. It bridges us to our bodies in such a way that I find really, really powerful. So I don't know if we need to hierarchize like who's what's the most powerful force in this world. And they're all probably related. Um, but boy, beauty's got my vote these days as the way forward now that question think, kind of implied yeah sorry Tom. I was just, no please well, well I, I was just gonna, gonna say I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry man you, you want to go ahead yeah uh i was thinking about um beauty uh in the world and also art and reading and philosophy and all of the, the things that enrich us in our life, all of these things are beautiful. And each of the things that are beautiful to us resonate with what gives our life meaning. And so I think I go back to this, you know, it, it's like if you're moved by the beauty of a rose, or by the passage by Dostoevsky or, or whatever it is that moves you, that tells you what's meaningful to you. And when you have meaning in your life, it is possible to create hope, to be hopeful for something when you are moved. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think that's such a powerful, I think that we're finding our way to loving the fact like being moved, being affected, that's where it's at. I want that. I used to think that the idea would be to be more impenetrable. That 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 was this notion of strength. Now I more feel like I, I think it's such a kindness, it's such a honesty to be moved by each other, be moved by the world, and it's such a good word, the world of affect, the world of move, movement. Um, anyway, I yeah, I think that hope begets beauty, beauty begets hope. I think they are related. I think hope is itself, when it's truthful, when it's authentic, is itself a beautiful thing. Um, but I also think, well, we could talk about this for hours. I should probably stop here in a minute. But one thing about beauty that, uh, yes, meaning, but one of the things I love about beauty is you don't need a, there needs, there's no need for any story around it or narrative. Uh, it is an immediate sensation. Uh, and sensation it is uh, you you feel it and so yes to meaning but oftentimes a lot of people's notions of meaning require a story or a narrative it is meaningful to me because and and the thing about beauty is that the means and the ends come together you don't need a story you don't need a word you don't need intellect um, it is to me a wonderful bottom line but 
we could, I should probably shut up, keep moving. That was a good point, though. I liked it a lot the, mm -hmm. about the present versus the future. Beauty is mm -hmm. a present uh, sensation or experience, mm -hmm. and hope is a more future focused one. All right, let's. Uh, we've got one hand up here. Jackie, one second. I will um, unmute also, you. Uh, Sonia, if you could yeah. advance or BJ advance the slide just so people can see where oh, sure. great graphics came from. I just want people to know that. Oh, those thank you, are... Tom. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Jackie. How are you? Um, so I'm a certified dementia practitioner and I work with families um, all the time who have got loved ones in our memory care. And the idea of hope and beauty for them is so difficult because they're dealing with all the losses they see in their loved ones. And so I struggle sometimes um, helping them find the beauty and hope through the disease process of dementia and helping them find that there is still beauty in life for their loved one. And, um, and that, you know, helping those family members get to the point where they see that their loved one is living in the moment and just taking those moments in and that there isn't like there isn't later for them. And we need to, I need to help and help the family see that it, it is just now. And I struggle with that when I go home, because I think what else, what other tools can I provide families? Because when they leave and they entrust them in our care and we have a great time with, with their loved ones, um, the families don't see that. They don't see the members living a full 24 hour, full, beautiful, meaningful life. And so it's, it's struggle. It's a struggle for me um, as an educator and as someone who cares for these people and who involves the families and who wants them to be able to see the hope and the fact that mom or dad are now living this beautiful life, but a different life. Yeah. Uh, I, and, you know, it, while you were speaking, thank you for that comment, because it really brought up to me a lot of this talk. I was thinking about myself and hope. I was thinking about families who have uh, people who have very impaired mental status. And it made me start to think while you were speaking, what is hope like for a seriously demented patient? And I don't have an answer for that because I think uh, that a lot of the structure that I've built around this lecture has to do with being able to process into the future and think on some sort of deeper levels. Um, now in responding to the families around uh, hope, I think it does come back to um, what type of hope suits them best. We'd spoken about the hope of goal focused, how do we make someone comfortable or seamlessly transition to hospice? that can be a task that can give people hope. But the other type of hope we'd spoken about, the Christian type of hope of abiding and waiting and observing what's happening now, that can be a very powerful and comforting hope also. And, and my last thought about that is, as we've said through this talk, sometimes hope is not comforting, it's agitating. And sometimes places like denial are comforting, but we aren't always advocating that as a long-term option. And so there is just struggle associated with all of this. And um, you have to find the form of hope that can be sustaining for that person. Mm. And that makes sense. It, it's just tough. It's tough when, you know, everybody's got different personalities and different needs. And, you know, I just, I want families to be able to see the beauty in this process. Well, it may not be beautiful to them and right. that's equally okay. Mm -hmm. They may reach a place where they'll look back on it and it will be. So I think it, it does circle back around to letting the folk in your world have what they need in the, in the way they process this too. Mm -hmm. Just do your best to present what you see 
in the experience and maybe it will rub off as we talked about. And yeah, amen. And Jackie, I, I'm with you. You know, this, I do think one of the, the dementia, because it does it robs you of this sense of future and past of memory and this, it, it hope and some of these, this, these words lose their meaning therefore. Um, but I do wonder as you're talking, Jackie, if, you know, this idea of beauty, the family may not be able to say, this is beautiful, um, but you can hold that with your, you get to pull back on the lens in ways perhaps a family can't. And if you take this notion of beauty as being the truth incarnate, there's something gorgeous about that back to authenticity. This, this is very real. And at the very least, this family has access to they're in something that's very real. They may wish it were otherwise, et cetera. Um, so they may not be in a position to call it beautiful, but you can hold it as such because of its honesty, because of sort of the rigor that it requires to be engaged with that truth. So I don't know if that helps at all, but for your own well-being, Jackie, doing this very hard work, I would hope that you get some jollies out of seeing the truth play out, whatever the heck that truth is, even if it's a horrifying one, there's something powerful about it. at least it's true. Does that register with you at all? Very much so, very much so. And I work really hard at staying in the moment with people and being able mm -hmm. to, um, when I leave at the end of the day saying, there were some beautiful moments today. There were some hard moments today, but really just pulling them all together and filtering them out because it's a part of the process. And so I appreciate you taking time to listen. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jackie. Okay, all right, so got a few more questions. Thank you guys so much for staying over. I know I knew this was going to be a, a good one. Um, so one of the questions that came in, Bruce Lipton, Biology of Belief, says that cancer patients that do the best are the ones who know they will be okay versus the ones who hope they will be okay. The point was to know even when the outcome will be uncertain. So I guess my question is, which patients do you see doing better? The ones who know or the ones who hope? I think that's a, a really good and interesting question. Knowing that you're gonna be okay, obviously is not hoping that you're gonna be okay. Knowing is a comforting place. And so if you ask that person how they're doing, they're gonna say they're doing better than the person who might hope to be doing okay, who might say, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing my best. And so what, I think this talk is saying is that hope is embracing the uncertainty and that the someone who knows that their goal is going to be met is not hopeful. And that's okay. Um, but but the point of that talk was that there's a place of uncertainty that isn't always comfortable, but is authentic and may stimulate bigger questions. So they may actually expand out beyond the knowingness of one thing. And actually, Tom, I'm just going to ping off of that to another question that came in because it kind of deals with something you just mentioned. This person said, if hope is defined as a desire for something good in the future, therefore accepting the uncertainty, is it fair to say that acceptance is the key component that distinguishes hope from wishful thinking? seems fair to me. What we're talking about is hope is a in something that is focused in, in what's real, something that needs to be generally possible, potentially possible. And so, uh, yeah, I think acceptance is, is, I think that hope also can enrich acceptance. It can make uh, not just, it, it can make what's changing in your life, not just a defeat. Uh, it can be something that's built into what you know about your life and, and your world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does, yeah, to me. Yeah. Does, <laughs> yeah, it does to me. And I do think, I, I think this is the difference. And a phrase came up of we've been trying to kind of find the sort of 
lame language, but the good hope versus the bad hope. I remember, maybe it was Frank Ostaseski, someone's talked about mature hope versus immature hope. And I think the difference is, is what this person's pointing to is if we accept, it's a little bit like that faith question. We, we accept what God or creation, what's going to happen um, because it's bigger than us. We can hope for things, but we have to accept what, what is. Um, I think that acceptance piece is what pushes us towards uh, mature hope, uh, the good version, the useful, the helpful version. Um, so yeah, I think those are all entwined. And I think it again, which one is back to acceptance has to do with the truth, has to do with reality, has to do with authenticity. So these are all entwined one way and another. And, and quickly on that note, I saw, I quickly gauged at the chat. I saw BJ, hi BJ, BJ Styles. I saw your question about optimism versus positivism. I, I don't know. There's maybe at some point we're getting really eggheady. I know I'm I'm getting up in my brain, but from my money beach, I think the optimism is a little bit like uh, it, it it presumes that bad things, hard things, can happen too. But you're you are you're benevolently spinning the future. Positivism to me is low is less tolerant of negativity. It crowds out as part of the picture. That may be a distinction that I'm just making up, but that's what I thought about when I saw that question. Okay, guys, shall we, anything else out there? Well, there's one, let me see, there's a follow-up to the um, accepting the uncertainty. Uh, Siba said, except without surrendering is what I meant. Um, but I don't see, but I'm not sure. I want to make sure we're actually answering your question. The right in, if there's something we can kind of clarify on that. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll get that. But um, Siba, if we didn't answer your question, email us um, and I'll check in with you. I want to make sure that we address it. And thank you everyone else for just kind of chiming in with your beautiful comments um, about everything that was mentioned today. Really appreciate all of the, the sharing. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, BJ. Happy you, Friday Tom. to everyone. Happy weekend. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for spending time with us. And thank you both for going over. Really appreciate it. And happy birthday, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great weekend, thank you, everyone. everybody. Thanks, guys. That was fun. Thank you so much, Tom. Tom Grathy. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>